we became very loud in international society. Two things from space looking at Earth. One's the Great Wall of China and the other is Volodymyr Zelensky's balls to frighten the world about the possibility of nuclear war. Dr. Strangelove. There will be alarm around the world. Finally, her son returns home. History is history. Right. Good day, everyone. You're watching Face to Face on United24, and I'm Glib Bulya. Today we speak about the role of media in a war of Russia and Ukraine and the global challenges of media and informational warfare. And our guest today is one of the most experienced and respected people, Jeff Tribble, international journalist, media manager with a lifelong career. Jeff, we are very glad to see you. Hello, Glebe. It's nice to be with you. Jeff, so my first question is, uh, you have a great uh, knowledge of working with the Soviet Union and Russia. You're very experienced and you've been uh, Stay, you've been living in Russia since 1970s. You've been working with Russians since 1970s. Uh, could you please tell me about that experience and uh, the way uh, Russian professionalism changed over those years? Thanks, Cleve. Look, I, I think it's important to understand that there really are two ways in which media work in society. Uh, there are a lot of complicated theories, but it boils down basically to two things. Either the media serve the interest of the state or the dictator or the religious authorities, or the media have some kind of independent role to serve as a kind of a check or balance on the activities of leadership. As I say, there are a lot of complicated theories around media, but it really boils down to those, those two options. And for the entire time that I was involved with the Soviet Union, and then for the most part involved with Russia, and looking back on the history of Russia and the Russian Empire, the role of media in Russia really has always been to support the state and the policies of the state. Now, this may sound somewhat surprising because during, for instance, the Glasnost period, when I was in Moscow as a correspondent, I was there 1986 to 19. 91 as a correspondent, there was a feeling, and it was a true, of course, that the media in many respects were opening up. But if you really looked carefully at what Glasnost was doing, it still was serving the interests of Mikhail Gorbachev and his reform efforts in the Soviet Union. It really was not truly independent. Um, now, I don't want to take away from the courageous journalists in Russia uh, Dmitry Muratov and the journalists of Novaya Gazeta, the journalists of Medusa before they were forced to leave Russia and so many others. There are independent journalists and some tradition of independent journalism in Russia, but for the most part, the trend has been for journalism to serve the interests of the state and the leadership. And of course, this is hugely obvious today when you tune into any Russian media, whether it's for domestic consumption or for foreign consumption, that it very much is carrying out the line of the Kremlin of what Vladimir Putin wants the media to be saying. At the same time, uh, lies works in the interests of uh, the Kremlin and uh, personally Vladimir Putin. And I can say that Ukraine was severely hurt by all the lies conducted by media outlets. And uh, due to lies, Things started with Kremlin, because uh, definitely people lived in different realities. So the Russians, they created some alternative reality, uh, having nothing to do with the actual world. But that allowed them to annex the Crimea, and this is where all the things uh, they started. Uh, I believe it's not the sole Russian strategy and distortion of information and those alternative uh, realities, they are a matter of problem globally. Can you see where it is going? And uh, have we already lost the war with the lies? Because it's difficult to uh, tell the truth all the time, because truth sounds the same and lies is much more interesting for people, right? Yeah, you know, um, whether you call it hybrid warfare 
or as the Chinese refer to it, unrestricted warfare. The conduct of war by means other than direct combat certainly has become greatly more sophisticated in the last decade, and specifically thanks to the rise of the digital media environment and consumption of media. Don't forget that the algorithms that drive social media, that push content to us, are those that play on emotions. They want us to get excited about buying a product, making a trip, going to see a film. They're very focused on increasing our emotions. So the more outrageous the lie, the more outrageous the content, the more likely it is to push through the algorithms and to succeed. It's the sober, serious, frank, not quite so, I'll use the word sexy discussion, not quite so lively and sparky that doesn't draw as much attention. Look, you know, this is nothing new. It was Mark Twain uh, back in the 19th century who said uh, a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth can put its boots on. Well, today a lie gets halfway around the world before, um, gets 10 times around the world before the truth can get its boots on. When Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi uh, was shown in a faked video to appear as though she was drunk, uh, that video was shared something like 20 million times before it was taken down, and it was taken down fairly quickly. So these things propagate quickly. It makes it much more difficult to, it makes it much easier to push them out and makes it much more difficult to counter them through some kind of alternate uh, strategy. And it's clear when we look back on Crimea uh, 2014 and what happened there that the ground for this was being laid by Russia, by the Russian media in various ways, including in the, in the information space for a long time before that. And what I'm talking about here generally is a negative image of Ukraine being put out by Russian channels. Uh, I've seen research, for instance, that uh, for Ukraine, the most common images of Ukraine in films made around the world, and specifically those pushed by the Russians, were uh, emphasizing either corruption as a main theme, or Ukrainians were portrayed as being the mafia, or Ukrainian women were the prostitutes in movies. There was a relentless negative image of Ukraine. They hadn't yet gone to this whole crazy Nazi idea and Ukraine needed to be denazified, but the seeds of the campaign were there in the run-up to Crimea already to present a relentlessly subtle but relentlessly negative image of Ukraine. That's a very good thing about Ukraine, that we became very loud in international society. But at the same time, people just dropped the article there uh, calling Ukraine only this year, which which is delightful. But at the same time, I do realize that uh, Ukraine was absent in uh, global perception. That was just one of those countries with uh, little GDP per capita, uh, minor market, and uh, some fascinating, extraordinary things like a great IT sector and uh, space economy. Yeah, like being one of the top space countries. That's what uh, most of my international friends were very surprised about, like, how can you create rockets and satellites with a, such a poor economy? Which was true in a way. But right now, people start knowing Ukraine. They are learning about it, opening it up. And uh, unexpectedly, even for us, Ukrainians, uh, 2022 became uh, internationally the year of Ukraine because you hear about us all the time. But what many of us are afraid of, uh, can there be some kind of a fatigue about Ukraine? Because, well, we are uh, global news, but in terms of media consumption, uh, people might want to change. People love change, right? And uh, is there a way to overcome that, to give some new knowledges, information about Ukraine, or somehow to become uh, more common and, again, part of uh, international uh, media agenda. It's a two-edged sword. If the situation in Ukraine improves for any reason, 
uh, if Russia is defeated in Ukraine or suffers setbacks in Ukraine, uh, there will be more fatigue, there will be less interest in the story, and so there'll be less interest, but at the same time, Ukraine will be in a better position. Uh, unfortunately, the easiest way to keep attention and the way attention will stay focused on Ukraine is if the conflict continues and if there are terrible, I can't think of another word, terrible additional developments. If Russia somehow uh, redoubles and uh, launches invasion in uh, a larger scale again, if it resorts to use of weapons of mass destruction, if it resorts to other kinds of techniques and things that they may be considering, there will not be fatigue. There will be alarm around the world. And that, of course, will mean Ukraine's in a terrible position, but the attention will uh, remain. Uh, I think that Ukraine has been, I know that Ukraine has been very resilient in developing its messaging strategy. It started out, frankly, in a very important place with President Zelensky, who uh, was instantly everywhere on all screens, speaking to audiences around the world in multiple languages. Uh, and there were, of course, anecdotes about him right away and how proficient he was. There was the anecdote about you can only see two things from space looking at Earth. One's the Great Wall of China and the other is Volodymyr, Volodymyr Zelensky's balls. And so you had that that image of Ukraine out there right away. But subsequent to that, um, uh, through using uh, memes, uh, through using average people as heroes, uh, through using extensively and quickly uh, footage from battle made available from the Ukrainians, from clever marketing um, and other skillful applications, Ukraine has continued to evolve its messaging strategy in such a way that I think it, it has held attention. Look, you know, there are other things happening in the world and that, that, that will certainly be the case. Here in the United States, we're looking at a change in Congress coming in January. And as the Republicans take over the House of Representatives in the US, we may see attitudes changing toward Ukraine and assistance to Ukraine. We can talk about that some more. Um, but for the moment, I think the Ukraine really has that Ukraine really has been quite successful in evolving a messaging strategy that has uh, worked and shape a, and shaped for many people their first image of Ukraine, and for many other people reshape their perception of what this thing is called Ukraine. In your opinion, uh, what are most vulnerable areas in in the U.S. In the US. Maybe they are different for Republicans and Democrats. Maybe they are common. But what things you as an American, as a professional, professional media manager and a journalist, uh, you worry most? So let me start by saying that um, Vladimir Putin is not a chess player. He's a, a martial arts aficionado. And in the martial arts, uh, to succeed, as far as I know, um, one thing that you use is your opponent's strength against your opponent. If your opponent is charging at you, you don't necessarily repel your opponent. You take your opponent's energy and utilize that to throw your opponent over your shoulder. Uh, Putin and his apparat has understood that it needs to probe the strengths of Western societies, of U.S. society, for instance, and take advantage of those strengths in a way that they can work in Russia's interest. The information space is one of those places because we are very reluctant in the United States. I can't speak for other countries, but I think it applies to, to many other countries. I'll speak for the U.S. We're very reluctant to take steps to shut down speech no matter how irresponsible or inaccurate it is. We don't do that. We traditionally have counted on the marketplace of ideas, of everything getting put out there, and the best information then should win the argument. I think that whole concept of marketplace of ideas comes into question during the digital era and when bots can be generating millions and millions of messages so you're not having one person and one voice. But leaving that particular thing aside, I do think that we have seen the effects of the Russians taking advantage of already existing political trends and discussions in the United States and figuring out ways to amplify those trends in such a way that it works to their interests. 
Let's look at the most basic, which is isolationism. Uh, here in the United States, we're not eager to get involved in, in foreign wars. Right now, we've also had a bruising experience in the last year of coming out of the long-running conflict in, in Afghanistan uh, in a way that did not produce lasting success for all the effort the United States and its allies put into it. So you have a, a natural feeling, a natural kind of support for isolationism. Why should we get involved in happenings in these countries far away? We're safe and secure here in the United States. Let's just stay uh, away from it. And there's a substantial amount of the American political spectrum that very much accepts that, that reasoning. They tend to be on the Republican side of the political spectrum, but not only because there's a branch of isolationism that is very much on the far left of the American political spectrum, which is not getting involved in foreign conflict because that is imperialism on the part of the United States and it's caused great damage around the world. So you can see people on the far left saying, you do see people on the far left saying, we shouldn't get involved in this because this would be American imperialism and we've already seen the legacy of that and terrible failures elsewhere around the world. So in this idea of let's stay out of foreign conflict, we see a kind of synergy between one traditional conservative part of the spectrum and a liberal part of the spectrum. That's one thing. A second thing is that we're spending money. We're spending billions of dollars aiding Ukraine. Can't we use this money for domestic purposes? Of course, that's a natural argument that you would expect to be had. And there's some resonance in that, in that argument here. Um, and then ultimately, what we're seeing the Russians play very directly is threat of nuclear war, threat of escalation. And that sort of goes back to the first point about we shouldn't get involved because if we do, we might risk nuclear conflict with Russia. And that conflict could easily spill over into Europe and it could even spill to the United States if it becomes a strategic war, if it becomes a global war that would involve the United States and Russia. Um, I recall that same argument going back to the early 1980s when the United States was preparing to deploy two new nuclear rocket systems in Western Europe, and in fact, in the end, it did so, that the Soviet Union strongly resisted because they realized that it would make obsolete much of the forward defenses that the Soviet Union had in the Warsaw Pact. And the Soviet Union mounted a huge propaganda campaign to frighten the world about the possibility of nuclear war. There were huge rallies in Central Park in New York and around the United States. There were films made, uh, one called The Day After. And I'm talking back 1982, 1983. So they, they have practice. Dr. Strangelove, like well, the, the greatest movie ever. Going back even farther to the 60s, you had uh, Strangelove and, and those ideas being, being brought forth as well. So th these ideas are out there. And I would say that these vulnerabilities and opportunities are there. There is, Gleeb, and I'm sorry to go on a bit here, but there is one other aspect that the Russians have played on um, with, I think, some level of success. And that is by propagating a message that Russia stands for traditional values. This means anti-LGBTQ. That works in the U.S., right? In the conservative. Well, there, there is an element of the U.S. population, you might call it the conservative Christian right, where there uh, also are concerned about these values, uh, anti-gay marriage, anti-gay issues, and other things that are perceived as uh, an invasion of certain liberties, where uh, the Russians can put out the idea of traditional values represented as opposed to, they, you know, they often refer to kind of European values, means things like uh, um, gay rights and, 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 and other things that we would just consider part of the liberal agenda in our political spectrum. So there is a certain affinity there. Uh, there's no surprise that some of the espionage efforts uncovered by the United States, by the Russians in the last decade have been aimed specifically at conservative organizations such as the National Rifle Association in the United States, Marina Butina, uh, who was arrested in the United States and eventually sent back to Russia. And you can see her on RT today. Um, uh, it would be an example of someone who was actively working to tighten connections between Russia and this conservative, in this case, the pro-gun elements uh, of uh, American society.
at the same time, people voting for this criminalizing uh, used to be open homosexuals in the past, like Anton Krasovsky, uh, a, a prominent media manager uh, and uh, TV figure in, in Russia. Well, he's uh, HIV positive. He's uh, used to be openly gay. Now he uh, he's very anti-gay propaganda, which doesn't make sense at all. But this is what Russian uh, media strategy is all about. You just make things that are far from being true, far from having any logic at all. But as long as you keep on repeating that, people start believing that. So city of Kherson was occupied by Russians and they started, well, first of all, they tried to annex it through some kind of a fake referendum. And they kept on saying some very, uh, well, loud words like, finally, Kherson returns home forever with Russia and so on. In, in a month, they have to leave. Yeah, armed forces of Ukraine kicked them out of Kherson. They had to leave. Well, and all those things, they like make very little sense. Today, they are saying they try to create some additional notion that Russia, being a nuclear state, can't lose. And they try to create this fake reality part of our way of thinking, as if it is true, which is far from being true, of course. Even historically, it might just makes very little sense. First of all, Russia, by their own terms, they are not fighting the war. They have a special operation. But there is one strong point about that. Mostly in their psychological operations and in their media campaigns, uh, they are targeting some fundamental things with the lies they have, but mostly they don't produce any other option. So for example, if they are targeting some US policies about whatever there is about some liberal values, uh, very rarely they provide some other option. And when you don't have any other option provided during the critics, uh, while you're criticizing something, uh, there is no possibility to answer you back because you only hear some negatives about yourselves, but without any alternative, you don't know how to answer that. And uh, if you are not a rational person, and there are very little of us who are rational, correct? You just mostly tend to agree with that. Let me put a, let me put a, a specific definition here on one aspect of this that I think would help people, and that is this concept of whataboutism which is very much a Russian technique. So you raise criticism of Russia, right? Russia has um, shot down a civilian airliner and they will immediately come back and not address that subject, but raise some weakness in the West. They will remind, and maybe it might be accurate, they will remind that the United States Navy mistakenly shot down an Iranian airliner back in the 1980s, which is true, but that's not the subject. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about what Russia has done, but they go the whataboutism route and, and, and the conversation thereby is immediately derailed. You never get to the real substance of the issue and it never is addressed because of the bounce back. And the other thing about whataboutism is that what they come back with is often very weak by comparison to what to what the to what the charge is. I remember having a discussion way back still in Soviet times with a Soviet legislator uh, at Spaso House at the residence of the American ambassador in the Soviet Union, now now Russia. And he was complaining. Um, um, he, he was uh, we were talking about this was a time when they were start talking more about Stalin's legacy and uh, the truth was being revealed about just how many people had been killed in the purges, had, had died in the forced famines, uh, and, and other things that were happening. And specifically, we were talking about the Gulag concentration camp system. And the Soviet official spoke up and said, yeah, but you know, you had McCarthyism in the United States. And I just looked at him and said, well, yeah, it's a shame about those millions of people who died under McCarthyism, isn't it? And of course, I'm making light of that. McCarthyism is a dark right. chapter in American history in the 1950s and did affect the lives and careers of many people. But you never had those casualties. But it wasn't the death of millions of people uh, at the hands of, of a government. So, um, yeah, uh, they have long experience at making these arguments confusing and making you forget even what the original question was as they put out their narrative. Now, I've got to say something about the history thing because it's just ridiculous to say Kherson 
has always been Russian or has been Russian forever. Well, you know what? Forever is a very long time. And rather than going down the rabbit hole of what exact year did Catherine the Great do this to establish that in order to become this and therefore it has to be Crimea, it's not constructive to go down that rabbit hole in any kind of discussion with the, with the Russians. History is history. You go back far enough and we're all in that part of the world, you're all Lithuanian or you're all Polish or you're all dominated by, by cultures from the East. I mean, come on, let's not play that game. It's, it's not a constructive discussion. What you need to do and what you need to focus on are the realities of the modern world. And that is Ukraine and its borders are and have long been internationally recognized, including by the Russian Federation, which was one of the very first states, if not the first state, to recognize the independence of Ukraine and its borders. And then in agreement after agreement after agreement after agreement subsequent to that, whether it's about civil aviation or fishing or the Budapest 1994 agreements under which Ukraine gave up its nuclear arsenal and in return received guarantees from all participants, including Russia, for its borders and that, uh, and that these countries would not use armed force against Ukraine. Agreement after agreement in which the Russian Federation acknowledges Ukraine as a country with the borders that existed at the time the Soviet Union collapsed. Full stop. That's all that matters in the discussion. This is a modern European country with well-established international borders. Don't let the conversation go about that to what was happening in 1700 something or another or in 1400 AD or whenever. It, it, there's no way to have a constructive discussion around that. We have the world today that we have with the borders that we have. Can borders change? Yeah. I'm not saying borders can't change. Um, I lived in the Czech Republic for a time, which had, as we know, the velvet divorce that broke up Czechoslovakia peacefully through negotiation into two distinct countries that live comfortably as neighbors, the Czech Republic and Slovakia. So I'm not saying borders need to be forever, but any change in borders or any change in the order particularly that is the post-World War II order that by and large has served us pretty well in terms of preserving peace, pretty well, um, are, are things that need to be approached very cautiously. The Russian argument on the face of it is just ridiculous about this historical this and that and the other thing. Jeff, thank you so much. I wish we could have this interview face to face. I hope we'll do that any other time. But thank you for being with us. I'm confident we'll do it together next time, and I hope we'll do it right there in Kiev. Take care and keep well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, you've been watching Face to Face on United24 with uh, me, Glib Boyak, and our guest, uh, Jeff Trimble.